guys, welcome back to the Arsenio Bug Show. You already know who it is, but today it's not about me, it's about the other man I got on the other line. You know what, we actually connected recently, and I realized that this guy did an ultra marathon. And as you guys know, and how many complaints I put in in terms of my body and what I had to endure at the Beast in Wahine, Thailand, that was only a half marathon. This guy did a ultra and so when I was, I'm so intrigued by people who actually have, to, they push their bodies to the, the physical limit. And not only that, but the mental limit and everything else that comes in to play when you're actually, put, when you're going through that much pain, a significant amount of pain and wanting to give up, but you keep telling yourself no. So without further ado, Jonathan, man, thank you so much for coming on today, man. Man, it's my pleasure. I'm so pumped to be uh, to be a part of your show, man. I'm excited about this conversation. Yeah, thank you so much again because, uh, again, I just love bringing people on to share their, ex- of course, their experiences and see, of course, how much value I could bring everyone. So here we go. I want you to kick it off. Start off with your fitness journey. You talked about being, again, a power lifter and a bodybuilder. So what got you into the fitness industry to begin with? Well, you know, fitness has always been a part of my life and, and really competition. And it's interesting because no one in my family played sports. No one in my family was really into sports or watched sports. And it was just always something that was ingrained in me almost genetically that I needed to be a part of. So uh, when I got into high school and, and different things, I played different sports. I played football. I wrestled. I played baseball. Uh, I did a little power lifting and then I went to college and in college I decided, man, I, I was looking at all these different majors that I could, that I could, you know, study. And I really just kind of decided, Hey, I really love this fitness thing. Mm. How about study that and maybe be a strength coach, uh, be a personal trainer, work in the fitness industry. So I actually started studying exercise science in college and through doing that, um, I was introduced to the bodybuilding community and even more so into the powerlifting community. And I, I don't know what it was. There was just there was this something about being a bodybuilder that one intrigued me and two really kind of pushed the idea of what could I push my body to? What could I what could I make my body do that maybe potentially it didn't want to do? And, uh. and it really just kind of took off from there. So I, I started bodybuilding and I started competing. I competed for almost about 10 years in bodybuilding, doing, you know, multiple competitions. And yeah, it was just, it was, fitness has just always been a way of life for me. Wow. That's awesome. So but for, for those people out there who don't understand, of course, bodybuilding and powerlifting, I probably don't understand it fully either. Could you give a, uh, like a nice comparison or talk about, you know, what's the, what are the differences between bodybuilding and powerlifting? Yeah. So, so I'll start with powerlifting. So power it, with both areas of fitness, you're, you're lifting weights. Yep. Um, with powerlifting, it's all about the maximum amount of weight that you can lift for one rep. And wow. so it was how strong and how much power can you generate for one max rep as heavy as you can possibly go. And there are competitions that are built around doing deadlift, bench press, and squat uh, for most powerlifting. You get in you can get into some Olympic lifting where you have a little bit more complex movements, but, but everything that I did was deadlift, bench, and squat, and just how strong could you be for one rep on each one of those exercises. Um, bodybuilding is completely and totally different. Bodybuilding, it's not necessarily how strong you are, but how great you look. So it's all about <laughs> your muscle size, your muscle tone, how lean you are, how aesthetic you look, um, how symmetrical you are from the right side to the left side, um, how mature your muscle bellies are, how full your muscles look. And, and really in, in the grand scheme of things, how big can you be and how lean can you be at the same exact time? And so you know, powerlifting, you've got clothes on and you're, and you're lifting heavy weight bodybuilding. You're in a speedo and you're up on stage with 
fake tan on and <laughs> olive oil sprayed all, all over yourself, uh, flexing to a crowd. So two drastically, totally different <laughs> communities. Oh, man. You know, speaking of bodybuilding, um, I don't know if you know the YouTuber Chris Jones. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I used to follow mm -hmm. him. What? Ooh, man, I can't remember. I rarely watch anything now because, of course, I do my own regime. But uh, I used to do some of his workouts, like back workouts or this or that. And the bodybuilding community, you know, of course, it took some massive hits last year. So there's, uh, there's a big problem with, of course, people, you know, claiming that they're – they call it natty, which means natural. Natural meaning yep. they do not juice up. And then other communities, like you heard about Rich Biana, obviously. And yep. there's another guy. I forgot his name, but – Again, they ended up deceasing, and then, of course, there was a big uproar in the bodybuilding community. But at the same time, in the bodybuilding community, they don't necessarily like those who do CrossFit. Do you understand why? <laughs> so, okay. So, one, uh, so I'll say this. I was, um, for the first few competitions that I competed in as a bodybuilder, I did untested shows. And... Um, Look, I, I'll be the first one to admit I did steroids when I was in college. Oh. I took some things that I shouldn't have taken. Um, but I'm also from the mindset that anything that you do, as long as you do it with a doctor's supervision and you're educated on what you're doing, um, potentially isn't harmful for you as long as you're not uh, going drastically overboard. And the, in the body community, building community some of those things are just what it is but i eventually went off of those things and became a natural bodybuilder but i'm telling you whether you're a natural or you're unnatural there are still guys competing as naturals that are taking way more drugs they just know how to get away with it a little bit better than what others do wow. um yeah it, it's it's the craziest community ever but man it, here's the thing Bodybuilders and CrossFitters, I don't understand why the fitness community can't get along because I we're know. all about trying to get better and make our bodies perform to the to the optimum yes. like place that we can. Uh -huh. but, but the bodybuilding community is a very selfish community. Um, uh -huh. You you are one person who competes against one person. There's no team aspect behind it, and. And, and I still have a lot of friends that are in the bodybuilding community, but it's it's a very self driven, selfish mindset. And it's all about how you look in the mirror, how your appearance is, the way you present yourself. It, it really ultimately has nothing to do with your body's ability to perform. It's all about what you're able to show outwardly. And, and I think we all know that when you're, when you're, you know, only paying attention to like, what what you're presenting on the outside and you're not working on the internal side of things like from a heart standpoint right it's it's not going to be a positive thing so yeah. you know bodybuilders they're just angry they're just they're just angry and they're hungry and they want to eat a piece of pizza that the crossfitters are you know depending on if you're paleo or not or are enjoying their community and they're enjoying time together um, you know, I even used to say, oh man, CrossFitters, they're really strong. They just don't look that way. Cause my whole concern was just the way that they look, but now I do CrossFit here and there. And, um, y you know, I, I think we should all be one happy community. Absolutely. Absolutely. And again, it's all about injecting as much positivity into the atmosphere as much as possible. So that's why I ended up like dropping out of those videos and whatnot, uh, and you know, the other things I've actually watched, however, with CrossFit, boy, I watched like the CrossFit games. These athletes are the most, mm -hmm. I've never, ho boy, who it's kind of like the Tour de France, right? Like, you know, going up the yeah. hill and use it. Oh my goodness. These athletes are beyond anything I could have ever imagined. You know, so. it, it's man, it's the craziest. So I live, I live in Tennessee, and I actually live about an hour and a half away from where Rich Froning lives. And Rich Froning, you know, for four years, five years in a row, was the fittest athlete on the planet, and probably still, if he wouldn't have stepped down, I still don't think Matt Frazier could beat him. No oh, offense Matt to Matt Frazier, Frazier but I there's a it. reason why Matt Frazier lives in Crossville, Tennessee, now to train with Rich Froning. It's because he's the best. Wow. Um, 
But these dudes are incredible, man. Like their stamina and and for me, it's their ability to just shut their brain off and just work is absolutely incredible to me. God, man, when I was watching that, that was probably the most inspiring movie slash video because, of course, I rented it on iTunes sometime uh, last year. And I swear, I mean, I can go out and do just like a hundred squats, like with ease after watching something like that because they are mm-hmm. remarkably inspiring. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, they're this. incredible, man. It, it's and and to me, that's what the fitness. And that's why people are so drawn to the CrossFit community. Absolutely. Is one because it, it is a sense of community. People are building each other up, and that's what the fitness industry is, is is supposed to be about. You know, I worked in the fitness industry for numerous years as a as a trainer, running gyms, um, managing gyms, managing fitness departments. And the biggest challenge of the, I, I would say, the normal person wanting to go and join a gym is because they're so afraid of being exiled and being looked at and judged judged by these it doesn't matter yep yeah and and it doesn't matter what you look like in the crossfit community if you're there and you put in the effort and they're there to help you and they love you and and it's it's a really cool community to be a part of ah see that man i'm one of i was one of those i'm guilty you know when i used to live in australia for a year and you know, people would look at me doing things or, of course, out there in America, you see a lot of guys on the bench who are actually severely obese and they would look at you or they mm-hmm. would judge you and this and that. What the hell are you doing? Oh, my God, man. It's just, again, it's the guys. It's the alpha. It's the alpha mask. So these guys actually yeah. wear those type of masks to say, hey, you know what? I'm going to put you down to feel better about myself. That's what this mask is comprised of. So I know exactly how a lot of people feel in terms of going into gyms and probably not knowing what they were doing. Like this guy just recently at a gym I work out at. Um, it was his first time going to a gym. He didn't know how to squat or anything. I didn't look at him and say, oh my, I didn't judge him not one bit because I was there at one point. He's going to get better. Mm-hmm. He's gonna we, be all we all were. We all were. That's, that's like – that's the biggest thing, and I, I think I think that's not only in fitness, but that's in society too, man, is we forget that at one point in time in everything that we've done in our life, we were a beginner. Yes. And we look at people who are beginning their journey in whatever new avenue that they're trying to step into, and we judge them because they're not great at it yet. And I think we forget that, like, hey, I, I, I was new at something at one point too, and I probably looked like an idiot while I was doing it. Right. Like, and and we forget to have that empathy for for beginners, and and I, I think we miss the opportunity to really build people up a lot um, because of that lack of empathy. Absolutely, yeah. Just like I mean, just being a teacher, I used to work with teachers who actually take all the confidence away from non-native English speakers because, again. You know, they believe that they are gods. And the thing is, that mm-hmm. ego and not being humble and not saying, you know what, I was in your position at one time. It's okay. I'm going to make you great. Like, I just, like, those aren't teachers. Those are critics. You know, those are, yep. oh, man. So, yeah, I completely agree. So, you went from, this is an interesting jump, though. So, you did your bodybuilding. You did your powerlifting. The next thing you know, ultra marathon. Like, between that, how did that all happen? Uh, so, um, so I probably, I I stopped competing in bodybuilding, um, from a competition standpoint about four years ago, I was preparing for a show and I had taken about a year and a half off to try to get as big as I possibly could. Um, and, and I was preparing for a show. I was midway through my, my diet and my father-in-law passed away and, When my father-in-law passed away, um, there was just a lot of challenges. Like my wife was, you know, was having to handle a lot of things and there was a lot of back and forth. And so I was really like, Hey, now is not the time for me to try to be focusing on me. Now is family time. And so once I stepped away, really the, the, the want to be a bodybuilder and the want to put in really that selfish effort in, in my mind went away. And, and for about, I guess it was for about three years, um, I was just working out. There was no real goal. And and so I would go in, I would still do my bodybuilding style workouts. I'd go in and work chest. And then the next day I'd go in and work, 
back and then buys and tries. And, and, and then eventually I started getting into doing a little bit of CrossFit, um, which was really weird because I, I had a lot of buddies who were bodybuilders that when I started doing some of this CrossFit stuff, I mean, there was a lot of ridicule. There was a lot of judgment. There was a lot of comments. And um, I, I, I really got into reading. I, I was never a reader. Mm. And I decided, hey, if I, if I really want to get better, I, I need, you know, I, I, I need to start reading. I need to start improving myself mentally. And I read this book, who is, and it was written by a Navy SEAL by the name of Tom Shea. Mm. And it's the, the title of the book is called Unbreakable. And in the book, he talks about being a Navy SEAL and all these different things. But he talks about he he eventually decided to be an adventure racer. And he had never been an adventure racer. And he put together this team. And they go out and he's talking about doing these adventure races. And I just thought they sounded really cool. Well, then he also talked about this, this personal challenge that he did where he went out and walked for 24 straight hours without taking a break and without stopping. And that this really helped him learn how to control his inner dialogue and really started helping him learn how to like really learn self-belief in his life and, and, and learning how to keep your word to yourself and come to find out he does this walk in Greenville, South Carolina, and he will take people and, and do this with groups of people. And so I was like, I, you know, I come home, I, I read this book and I tell my wife, Hey, I'm going to sign up for this walk. It's in September of 2017. I, I'm going to do this walk. And my wife and all my friends were like, you're crazy. You're an idiot. <laughs> yep. You'll, you'll, my wife didn't say that. My wife's super supportive, but my buddies were like, you'll never follow through. And, and look, I mean, Arsenio, like the truth of the matter is for a long time in my life, there was a lot of, there was a lot of commitments and a lot of things that I quit. Right. And, and so, and, and my belief in myself was pretty low. And so I was like, no, I'm going to do this thing. So I trained for it and I went and did it and it absolutely changed my life. And as, and as, and when I got done with that 24 hours, I remember, I remember driving home and I remember thinking in my head, what can I do now that's oh. going to – because now I believe I can do anything. Oh, that's so it. what that's can I do now that's going to challenge the hell out of me oh, yeah. that's going to hurt, oh. that's going to suck, that's going to be mentally and physically tough, that people are going to think it's the craziest thing that I could do. Yep. What can I do now to challenge myself and push myself beyond my – my preconceived limits. And Mm -hmm. in my mind, the most it's the, 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 like the most like ideal thing was I hated running. So let's sign up for an ultra marathon Mm -hmm. and let's skip doing a 5k. Let's skip doing a 10k. Let's not do a half marathon. Let's just go straight. And my very first run race ever, let's go (laughs) do a 50k trail race through the mountains. Oh, Okay, okay, so here we go, here we go. Okay, so it's so funny you said that. All of these memories and these things and these opinions and... Oh, man, I like I said, I just did the Beast and there was a girl there, a little short girl. I was like, how old are you, 21? I said, you in university? Yeah. And I said, your first Spartan race is a 21K and Beast? She said, yeah. She finished it. She's like, I feel good. I said, oh, my God, I feel like a tub of dog shit and you feel good? <laughs> I couldn't believe it, Jonathan. I said, <gasps> but then I saw some videos on Facebook last night. She is a monstrous power lifter. She's a trainee, you know, uh, what is it? Uh, uh, mm-hmm. What is it? Intern and stuff like that. So I'm just amazed. And you know what? That just inspires the hell out of me. So I had that same thing, Jonathan. Of course, I was dealing with a lot of mental issues. Of course, a lot of my listeners have heard this before. But back in 2015, my friend introduced Tough Mudder to me in 2011. I've always wanted to do it, but then in 2015, living here in Thailand and being completely broken psychologically, meaning everywhere I went, I treated myself like a victim. Oh, she gave me this. She looked at me this way. She looked at me this way. They did this and this and that. And I said, enough is enough, Arsenio. Go break yourself. So I signed up for a Mm -hmm. tough letter, and that was, I think, inside my biochemistry, that's when things started to change because I needed to get 
for the lack of better term, I needed to get the bitch out of my system. And so mm. that mm. it's a, <laughs> you know what I mean? I can't, I can't just go around just being evicted for the rest of my life. No one cares. And 30% of the people are glad that it's me. So I just needed to, so that's what I ended up doing. So you ended up signing up for an ultra marathon. Did that scare the hell out of you? Oh man. It's it, like, it scared the ever living <laughs> piss out of me, man. <laughs> and, and the thing was, is I had, and it was funny when I was getting ready for the 24 hour challenge, going to walk for 24 hours, there were just all these people that even people that like were, were close friends to me that were like, man, you can't do this. You're not prepared for this. You're not good enough to do this. And, and the thing about it was Arsenio is that I, for a long time in my life, I had allowed other people's opinions to dictate the direction and the belief uh, that I had uh, about myself and what I was able to accomplish in this world. There it is. And and after doing that 24 hour challenge, there was like literally when the, when the sun was coming up over the trees in Greenville, South Carolina, and I get goosebumps. Like I'm standing up right now. Like I wish you could see me in my kitchen because I'm standing up right now talking about this because I get just so jazzed up about it. Like a switch flipped in my mind and it said, if I can do this, I can do anything and to hell with what anybody else uh, thinks about what I can or cannot do. And so when I signed up for this ultra, I had all these people like, and, and even close friends who like, not everybody is trying to be negative. Like some people are like, honestly concerned about what mental issue are you having right now that is making you try to do these crazy things. Uh, and, you know, but I would have these people being like, well, you can't do this. You, you, you haven't done this. You haven't done this. You don't have this. You don't have that. And you know what? If, if, if in my mind, I just believe that if I sit around and wait for all of these other things to happen before I believe that I was created for more than mediocrity, that I was created for more than being average, mm. then I'm going to sit there and continue to wait for that to happen. And so I signed up for this trail race and I just said, man, screw it. I'm done waiting for all of these things that I'm not going to have, I'm just going to go out and do it with what I do have. And that is just wow. the heart in my chest and the brain in my head that it, that believes and knows that I was made for something greater than who I was right then in that moment. And man, it was, it was scary as hell. And I, I didn't know how to train. I'd never been a runner before. I'd, I'd been a weightlifter. I'd been a power lifter. Like I was, I was 225 pounds wow. like, and then all of a sudden I'm going to go be a runner, you know, and I'm two, I'm 225 pounds at five, eight. So it's not like I'm super tall. Right. And so I just, man, I just started running <laughs> and right. had no idea what the hell I was doing. And, and look, I'll be the first one to say this. I did the 50 K I went to the 50 K and I failed miserably. Oh, really? Uh, I made it. Oh, oh yeah, dude. I made it 23 miles and dehydrated. I had no clue about hydration and how to drink water and nutrition and all this stuff. And I ended up like passing out, not being able to stand up, like all types of stuff, 23 miles into this thing. And, wow. and the funniest thing about it is some people might look at that as a failure. I look at that as one, I made it 23 miles through the mountains on my very first race uh. when most people would never even attempt to do. And now I've got like I'm doing another ultra marathon coming up in the next three months. Uh, in 2019, I'm already looking for a 24 hour endurance run, which which is where you run 24 hours and get as many miles in as you can. And I'm looking for my first 100 mile oh, race that I, that I want to do in 2019. Okay. But, but, but like with the 100 mile race, that was almost, that's the same thing as, you know, David Goggins, right? Oh, I love David, David Goggins. Yeah. He did that 100 mile. He said after mile mark 71, everything with his feet were broken, stress fractures. He was urinating blood you know, I mean, but the yep. thing is, shitting up his back, sitting in the sitting in his lawn chair yep. with his with his box of crackers and his Gatorade. Yeah, <laughs> we know it. Hey, we know it, damn. Because those vivid images they stick with us. And damn, so he had to do it in twenty four hours, if I'm not mistaken. What is your time frame? What's the one hundred mile race for the time? Uh, the race that you're probably going to uh, enter in on. 
So the ones that I'm the ones that I'm looking at are going to have a 24 hour cutoff, um, which is why, like, wow. like for me, one, I just want to accomplish it. Like, so I, I it's funny. I signed up for a race because uh, now I have a running coach, uh, which is interesting because I've never allowed anybody to coach me in anything that I've ever done from uh, from bodybuilding or anything. I've always just done it myself. Right. Um, so I, I have a running coach. And the other day uh, I posted on Facebook that. I signed up for a 20 mile trail race in Chattanooga, Tennessee in four weeks and that I was going to use that as a training run. And this is a, a super hard, but it, but they have a 50 mile, a 20 mile and a 10 K. And I was like, look, I, I'm going to do a 20 mile. I'm going to get a little bit more race experience hmm. um, before I, I dive back into my 50 K. Every single part of me wanted to do that 50 miler. I haven't even, even completed a 50 K and I wanted to go do a 50 miler. And every part of me wanted to go do it. And people are like, why the hell would you want to go do 50 miles when you haven't completed 33? <laughs> and I said, because I believe I can. Ah, there you go. Wow. So you shut out a lot of outside noise. How are you? How are you able to how did you develop that mental capacity to shut out the noise? It has taken I'm 35 years old. It has taken me 34 and a half years to figure that out. Wow. And, 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 and here's the thing, man, it, it honestly comes from one, you know, I have, I have a, I have a pretty strong spiritual background, you know, spiritual, uh, side to me. Mm. Um, but, but here's what it really comes down to. I decided I made the choice that I'm going to believe what my creator says about me and what he says that I'm capable of mm -hmm. and what he says that he has for me more than I'm going to believe any Tom, Dick or Harry off the street <laughs> whose opinions are all coming from a selfish fear based position. Because here's the thing. Everybody has an opinion about what everybody else is doing. And a lot of times all of that stuff is coming from a fear or a self doubt that that person believes Absolutely. in themselves that they can't do it. Yep. So why could somebody else do it? Boom. There it is. I really and hope I, people understand that. I refuse to believe that anymore, man. Like I refuse to believe I, I, I like, man, it is, I refuse to allow anybody else to determine the direction of my life outside of myself. Period. Mm -hmm. That's it. Mm -hmm. I love that, man. That is amazing. If you said, believe in the Tom, Dick, and Harry, too. That's what I liked so much because, again, <laughs> people, don't, people don't understand what you just said in the last few minutes. A lot of people, especially in Asia, I'm not saying just Thailand, in Asia because they all walk the same. They all do the same things. They all stay quiet or they all stay loud. They all work together as a group. Once you take that unique aspect and you end up being completely different from the rest of the crew, you lose. And you know what? Mm. You lose in terms of people are going to start pointing fingers. They're going to start calling you, you know, if you wear short shorts as a woman, they're going to call you a whore. Honestly, honestly, I see it. And all these other things. And so, uh, I mean, you're just going to fit in with the rest and just not make any noise through life. And you're just going to acclimate with everyone. And then when you end up deceasing, everyone who had said those things about you, either they have already deceased or they already forgot. So just yeah. remember, everyone will forget everything once you die. So how about you just, ah, <sighs> just, just, and, go, and, yeah, go ahead. And that's the thing, man. Like that's, that's to me, like to me, I've, I've been surrounded my entire life from people who were okay being okay. I, I've been surrounded in my life with people who like, I, I don't understand how this happened. I don't understand where it happened to me and how I became okay with waking up every day and accepting mediocrity. Yeah. I, and and we do that every day with ourselves. We we wake up and we're like, like I'm just going to be a we, normal we, ass. We mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I just don't get it. And, and, and it honestly made a switch in me. Like, like I, I just decided, like, I – I am greater than mediocrity. I did not, I was not put here on this earth for on accident. I am here for a purpose. I am here to make an impact. And the only way that I'm going to be able to make an impact, if it's, if I start living my life with 
purpose. Yes. And to me, my purpose is to be the catalyst of self-belief in other people's lives. And the only way I know how to do that is to, to, is to be honest about who I am, to be transparent and authentic about who I am, to let people in to see that, and to go out and to just try to do what scares me the most. And, that, and, and that's really what it's about, man. The things that, that scare me the most or that I think are the most challenging, that, that's what I want to do. That, because it, to me, that's, that's what's going to be the gasoline for somebody else's fire. Mm. Wow. So have you ever like thought about it and sat down and say, you know what, what, what has influenced you? What has pushed you the most throughout this entire field, especially signing up for the biggest races? 2019 is going to be insane for a lot of people who are in and around my social circle. I mean, just explosions by explosions. Things are going down next year, but (laughs) <laughs> what has been that driving force? Like right now, like if you look at, okay, Arsenio, what's been your driving force? I don't use negativity as my driving force. I'm not going back and trying to seek vengeance. I'm not trying to prove anyone wrong. I'm following my life assignment work in terms of inspiring and helping people all around the world. So that driving force, of course, a failure that I suffered, what, 13 years ago. I remember uh, I messaged you this in a voice note. You know, that's not a driving force, but that's always in my mind, and it makes me smile. It's not negative. It's a beautiful thing. That was the greatest failure that turned success of my life, because if it wasn't for that failure, who knows where I would be in terms of my health right now. You know, if I look at living Mm. in a society such as this one and seeing the way people look at me, I say thank you for looking at me that way. I'm so grateful for you looking at me this way. Thank you for giving me that look. Thank you for holding your nose while walking by me. All of these things because it has nothing to do with me. All right. It's it's about me. The insecurities of other people don't pile all that garbage onto my spirit. My spirit is yep. my spirit, and no one's going to be able to enter that. And people really need to understand that. Yeah, no, and and you know, for me, really, man, it, it you know, I had like it's it's the craziest thing. Like literally eight months ago, mm-hmm. well, I guess it's it's November now, so almost eleven months ago, I was not a runner. I had never ran a race in my life. Mm. And I decided I was going to do this. And like my 50K, the one that I failed miserably at was only two months ago. Okay. And 11 months ago, I had never ran a race in my life. But I decided that I was going to start making positivity louder. That, That we have these platforms for social media and all these things where all these people spew hate and negativity. And I was like, no, this is going to be my platform for me inspiring even if it's just one person to live their life the best that they can this is what i'm gonna start doing and so i started kind of put my story out there that i'm gonna do this ultra and i'm gonna do this stuff and i get asked to be an ambassador athlete for a nonprofit of a bunch of runners and i never even ran a race <laughs> and then <laughs> you know amazing. and then the next thing you know like you know i i'm I, i'm i'm doing i'm doing talks i'm doing podcast interviews i'm being yes. uh, i'm being i'm talking with where you and i connected with ryan hartley on yeah. uh, on always better than yesterday and like literally all of a sudden these things started popping up in my life and and it, it I truly, truly started believing that if we cast off fear and the, and the fear of being, of not being accepted and the fear of failing and the fear of not being good enough. And we just start chasing after our dreams with all of our hearts and chasing after the, the, the idea and the mentality that we were made for greatness. We weren't made to be mediocre. We weren't made to be average. We weren't made to skate through this life. We were made to be great and to accomplish great things and make a big impact on this world. And I truly started believing that regardless of what anybody else said. And I'm telling you, dude, I like We've talked about. It. I'm a I'm a leadership junkie. I'm doing leadership talks. I'm that's that is my goal to be a leadership speaker one day and be a motivational speaker. 
And I, I started writing leadership articles and I had oh the God. CFO and the CEO of a company that I left making up fake email addresses. And I'm not talking about like a small company. I'm talking about like, you know, a $70 million company. These, these jokers are making up fake email addresses to write the most derogatory stuff that they can about me They're And like all of this negativity was surrounding me. And what I realized was, is that me shining my light as bright as what I could scared other people. And I loved Absolutely. it. Absolutely. I loved it. Like, I, I just, I just got to like, I'm a tattoo guy. I got tattoos everywhere. Yep. And, and it's funny, like in my professional life, when I'm suited up and different things, you can't see them, but I, I just got a tattoo on my right forearm and it says force of nature. And, uh, and everybody always asks me, they're like, why, why did you get that? And I look at it every day and this is why force of nature is an idiom. It is a, it, to say somebody is a force of nature is to say that they're somebody of like, strong personality or character like a hurricane or a tsunami uh. they are full of energy unstoppable unchallengeable unforgettable they are a person to be reckoned with that is the life that i want to live to inspire others to do the same thing that is what keeps me motivated that is what allows me to chase after these audacious crazy things and that's what honestly keeps me in the mindset that i don't give a shit if i fail I'm going to keep going anyway. And even if I fail, people can say whatever they want to say about my failures. The only way that I fail is, is if I quit and I ain't quitting. Mm. You know, there was a, there was a quote in the movie called, uh, the great debaters. And he was talking about Gia. Now Gia was, I'm guessing the goddess of earth or land. I could be completely mistaken, but basically every time she fell, she would get stronger. Because basically that land uh, makes her stronger. So the more she fell mm. down, it's kind of like life. The more you fall down and you fall down, you fall down, you fall down, you fall down, and you get up, you become stronger. And a yep. lot of people, they, they, they fall down the first time and they say, man, fuck this. I can't do this. I can't do this. No, that, that self-doubt comes. All those opinions come. Mm -hmm. Start saying, oh, man, I can't take failures. I can't take this. I can't take that. No, you take it all with a big smile because, again, like Gary Vee says, life is binary. You have to take your failures just as you take your successes. And guess what? Failures are probably much better than successes because that's where the growth is. So that's where you learn from. And that's the thing. Like, like I look at this the, the ultra – and I look at, okay, I made it 23 miles. I didn't, I didn't hydrate properly. I didn't know how to hydrate properly. Guess what I do now. And the, and the funny thing about it, man, and this is, and this is my mindset. Uh, when I did that 50 K, when I signed up for it and I went and I, I, I went to the race and I'm telling you, I was a fish out of water, bro. Like <laughs> I had never been to a race and you got, you got a dude who's only wearing like these short, short, silky shorts and Jesus sandals. Jesus. And this dude like won the thing. Like, what? and he's out there running without anything. That's Looks Jesus like a straight up caveman out of the, out of the mountains of Tennessee. And this dude just smoked everybody in sandals, like uh, a strap of leather and string on his feet. Right. Jesus. Like he might as well have been running barefoot. And I look like I'm ready to be out on expedition for 30 days. Like <laughs> it, it was the most ridiculous thing ever. And, but, but like, I look at it now, dude, and for that one, it was just it was just trying to finish. Now, and my coach knows this, and like because we talk about that. Now, I don't want to finish, bro. Mm. I want to be competitive. Uh, I want to win. Uh. I want to go out there and I want to crush ultra trail racing. And I, I don't. I, I'm not built for it. I have all these things stacked against me. I don't care. Mm. I don't need. I. I don't. That, the things stacked against me, those are just excuses. Right. I go out and I train and I run hard and I will be a competitive ultra runner. I, and, and I don't even say, like I used to say, oh, I'm like, I'm not a runner. I'm this. Like, no, I'm a runner and I'm a competitive runner. And I am going to compete in these races that I'm going to be in in 2019. And, and, you know, in the ultra community, there's like these big dogs, right? Like, you have the Hurt 100, which I just have a friend who, who got into. That's in Hawaii. You've got 
the Western States 100, which was the first ever in the original 100 mile race out in California. Like wow. my goal in the next five years is to race the Moab 200, which is a 200 mile race. It's to get into Blackwater, which is the the uh, uh, ba- or Badwater. Badwater 135 is one of the Ooh, hardest races that there is. That, David Goggins yep, has yep, ran it. Yep. I want to be in the Western States. Like like this is this is now a thing for me. Wow. And I will be a competitive ultra runner. I am a competitive ultra runner. People just don't know it yet. Man, that is inspiring. Oh, my God. Okay, so we know, guys, uh, with that being said, man, this has been a pleasure. I'm so glad that I'm actually getting back together with my man Jonathan sometime next week, guys. So stay tuned. Uh, Of course, on my Facebook, Arsenio Buck or the Arsenio Buck Show. Jonathan, where can people get in touch with you? Yeah, uh, you can you can hit me up on Instagram at the Jonathan Darling. Um, you can you can hit me up on Facebook. Uh, just look me up, shoot me a friend request, Jonathan Darling, and then you can also get in touch with me through my website, thejonathandarling.com. Awesome. Awesome. So guys, I'm going to put all those links in the description. Jonathan and I, we're going to be coming back together for a Facebook Live video coming up next week. I will, of course, put that schedule out and whatnot. But man, Jonathan, it's been a man. I wish I could keep going and going and going because <laughs> boy, next thing you know, I show up to work. They go, like, hey, man, what the hell? You showed up late. I'm like, I can show up late when I want to show up late. You know, I don't want to get fired just yet. <laughs> but, no, it's man, been awesome, man. It's, uh, uh, this, I, I enjoy talking about this stuff, man. I enjoy uh, it. It's, it's been it's been an honor. I, I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you so much for coming on. And so, guys, again, I'll put all of those links in the description. I hope you guys could take something. Uh, well, I know you guys have taken a lot from this. And again, Jonathan, it's been a plum pleasing pleasure. I'm taking uh, Les Brown's quote. But uh, yeah, thank you so much again for coming on, man. Yeah, it's it's my pleasure, man. I, I it's it's been awesome. Your your energy is infectious, man. It's been great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, and guys. With that being said, stay tuned for the next one, and this will be, of course, available. I'm hoping tomorrow. So when you guys are actually listening to this, it will be available, obviously. So guys, with that being said, I'm Arsenio. As always, over and out. <laughs>